this morning, brother. Uncle brought the Sunday school lesson, and that Sunday school lesson, I thought I was going to be in trouble there for a little bit because he's touching on some of the things that I'm going to bring today. Uh, it's good to see you here on the last Sunday of the year. Not only is it the last Sunday of the year, but also the last Sunday of the decade. And we're in between two holidays. We just celebrated our birth of our Savior to Christ. And now in a few days we're going to be celebrating the New Year. And it seemed like everybody had, had a enjoyable, enjoyable Christmas and that's good. And where is it? And it'll be safe when you celebrate the New Year's. Now, I want to bring you something and we're going to two different verses in the uh, Old Testament as a way of introduction. And we're going to turn to another passage in the Old Testament. And we're going to be looking at an uh, old uh, story that we probably all have heard before. So if you'll turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 16, verse 1. That's where we'll be going through first. Psalm 16, 1. Now this particular psalm is a song of David, like David for the path of life and joy. That's the theme of this uh, particular uh, uh, Psalms. Psalm 16, and verse 1. Preserve me, O Lord. Now, preserve here means to protect, to keep, to take care of. <coughs> He's asking the Lord to preserve him, to take care of him. And why? It says, for I put my trust in thee, do I put my trust. I want to look at this word trust for a bit. We learn at a young age to trust things, our people. We learn to trust our parents or our guardians. We learn to trust our friends. We learn to trust in our health. As we get older, we have our own family. We learn, we learn to trust in our own family. We can trust in our jobs. We can trust in our money, our homes, our automobiles, and our government. We can trust in, in uh, sports teams. But all of those things I just mentioned are things of the world. If you put your things in the trust of the world, it's going to let you down. Our families can let us down. We can let our families down. Our friends, they'll turn on us if we're not careful. Our health, many of us here already know this, so if you get the worse your health you're going to get. Your jobs, you can lose it. Lose your money, your house will be burned. And as far as our government goes, we never know who can get the trust up there and who not to. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 says this Jesus says this, Lay not up for yourself treasure upon the earth, where moth and rust do corrupt, and where thief breaks in through and steal. That's what's going to happen if we put our trust in the things of the world. But if we put our trust in the Lord, as David here says, He will provide for us and He will never let us down. Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 19. He provides us with our needs. It says this, But my God shall fly all your uh, needs according to his riches by, uh, in glory by Jesus Christ. There ain't nothing that we can need that God cannot provide for us. Matthew chapter 6 verse 20 goes along with the one I just read a while ago, but this time he says, Jesus says, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven for neither cloth our rust will collect, uh, corrupt, and thieves does 
not enter in the brick to steal. The Lord will bless us. And he'll be with us. He'll be with us when we're on the mountaintops. He'll be with us in the valleys. Psalms 23, verse 4. They believe, oh, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For thou art with me, and their rod and their staff, they comfort me. So no matter what we go through, and we don't know what's going to happen in the coming year. But we do know there's going to be time when we're in the valley, where we're going to be on the mountaintop, and we're going to be in the village. So when we, if, so if we put our trust in the Lord, it will bring us through everything that we face. Amen. Now I want to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 27. Deuteronomy chapter 27. I want to look at one verse. And that's going to be in verse 10. The Lord brings up to this after Moses uh, received the commandment uh, and he uh, to, uh, him and, uh, he delivered the uh, commandments that God gave him to the Israelites. And uh, he says this in verse 10. Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God and do his commandments and his statutes, which I have commanded you this day. Now, I'm going to put one word out of that verse, and that's trust or obey. As a young child, and throughout our life, we learn to obey. We learn how to obey our parents. We obey, learn how to obey the teachers. We learn how to obey the law. And those that have all the others that have authority over us. Now, when we disobey, there are consequences to pay. As a young child, we disobey our parents, there are consequences. When I was growing up, if my daddy told me and my brother to have that yard mow before he got off at work from work at five o'clock, if it wasn't done, there was consequences. And it was usually in the farm of about an inch and a half to two an inch. Usually letter of a letter, about thirty-two inches long. On one end had a buckle, and on the other end had holes to adjust the size. You know what I'm talking about. If you don't, it was a bell. Now, if we disobey the teachers, there are consequences of paying school. If we disobey the law, it depends on what it is. If it's a traffic fine or something, your checkbook is going to be a little bit lighter than what it was before. And the more serious the offense, the more uh, serious the consequences. Now, as believers, I know Christ is our Savior. If we disobey the Lord, there are consequences. In the Bible, it's called chasing or chast chastising. And that simply means to correct by punishment. In Psalms 8, uh, 118, uh, 18, it says, The Lord has chastened me sore, but he has not given me over to death. After crossing the Red Sea, Moses uh, in the Israelite completely across the Red Sea. The uh, Egyptian army was right behind them. And then when they crossed, the, red, the sea caved in and grounded all you know, the Egyptian army and their horses and everything. Shortly after that, the Israel 
robot started murmuring or complaining about water. They were thirsty. Later on, they complained about food. They said, why did y'all bring us out into this desert or starve to death? And in Egypt, we really say fed us. And right after they'd done that, a journey that should have took about five or seven days turned into a 40-year journey. Simply because they disobeyed the Lord. Now, that whole, that whole uh, generation uh, men and women at that time of the Israelites uh, did the Exodus. None of them seen the promise land. They didn't even enter into it. Now Moses, when he, uh, when they needed water, God told him, said, go speak to this rock and I will provide the water. Moses went up and struck the rock with his staff. He disobeyed the Lord. They did get the water they needed, but Moses was told that he would not enter into the promised land, but he said, see into it. And right before he died, he was allowed to go up on the mountain and look into the promised land to see it. Now there was two other men that was allowed to enter into it, and that was Joshua and Caleb. They was allowed to go into it because when they meant to uh, spy out the land, all these other spies come back and gave them a negative report. No, oh, they're giants in that land. The cities are all fenced. We have no way of conquering. But these two men, they come back and they give them the report that the Lord wanted them to give. And so they was able to see and go into the promised land. And Joshua even replaced Moses as the leader of the Israelites. Caleb, for his reward, God told him that he could have his choice of all the lands that was captured. So that was his reward for doing what he was supposed to do in uh, his report. Now we're going to go to the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Chapter 6. This is a very familiar story as I mentioned before. And as you now this, this story is, is way too long for us to go through every verse. We don't have time to do that. So what I did do, I went through and I looked at some verses and I picked out the one that uh, God's uh, just uh, laid up on my heart to bring. That is, is uh, important to what we're talking about today. Now, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness, wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God looked down to the earth that he made, and he seen all the wickedness of man. The imagination, that being the purpose and the desire, and it was without secret. And as I thought about this and I looked at this, I started to think about today. I mean, God is looking down today, what is he seeing in people's lives? Does he see all the wickedness that is going on in the world today? <coughs> Disobedient children. People living together out of wedlock and having babies out of wedlock. Homosexuality. Now it's called an alternative lifestyle. But all of that goes against God's creation and His will. There are more men who think they are women, women who think they are men, going to get surgery changed or change their gender. If you were born a female, you're a female. If you're born a male, you're a male. God don't make no mistakes like that. All the hate. 
hatred that is going on throughout the world towards other people. Shooting increases every year. Killing babies in the womb is okay. There were some congressmen, congressmen, some of them in Washington, D.C. is trying to pass a deal where after the baby is born, the parents have so long, and if they, something happens, they don't like that baby for if a health issue or deformity or something, they have the right to end that baby's life. Verse 13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence for them, and behold, I will, destroy, I will destroy them with the earth. He makes it known to Noah what's going to happen. He's going to destroy the world. But he also chooses Noah to, because he is righteous. Now, Noah was a preacher in a time when preaching was a, wasn't a very popular thing. So he, he chose Noah to, to, because of his uh, righteousness and he trusted and obeyed. And in verse 14 through 16, he uh, gives a blueprint to Noah on how to build the ark. Billy out of Gulf Wood in verse 14, the height, the length, the, the width. The levels on the inside and on the deck, a place for him and his family to live. He even tells them to put a window in. And he goes on for the other verses and he tells them what to load into the boat when it's time to load them in, in all the beasts. And if you leave there, you'll say it's a clean beast and the, and the clean fowls of the air, seven. Three females, four males. Of all the unclean animals, creatures, two, one male, one female. 
Now, to find out in the breeze waters, uh, God commanded us uh, clean and unclean. You'll have to come read through the uh, Bible and the law that was given to Moses, uh, Moses where it describes all that. And in verse 22, I'm going to go 18 first. Verse 18. But with thee, I will step in my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. He made, God made his covenant with Noah and his family. They would be the only one on the face of the earth that would be saved. Verses 19 through 20, God instruct Noah on the uh, who would be loaded on the boat and when? That included his family, the beasts, and the fowls of the air. Verse 21. God instructed Noah about the, about the loading of the boat when they come in, the animals came in. And in verse 22, it says this Thus did Noah according to all God's commandments, so he did. Noah was about to embark on something that he, he had never done. Building a boat, a big boat, an ark. And he worked on it. Now I tried to research to find out how long he did actually take to build the ark. I looked at several sources, and the most common year that I was to find it took him 120 years. But there was some that said that the other indication that it took longer. But it really doesn't matter how long it took. The point of it is that he trusts and obeyed the Lord and he done it. Now, this should be a good example for us. that ark the whole time he was building it he was being mocked by his people all around him they were with him wickedly and he was obeying the Lord and they just they just poured it on him every time they had a chance they would mock him make fun of him plus we might not realize it or want to admit it but we are being mocked because we come to church on a regular basis. Sometimes it's from our own family, too. Now, in uh, chapter 7, verse 1, And the Lord said unto uh, Noah, Come now all the house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteousness before me in this generation. So God now instruct Noah and his family to enter into the ark. In uh, chapter 7, verse 2 and 3, God released the animals forth into the ark. Uh, the uh, clean animals and the unclean animals. And in verse 4, so this is, For yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living uh, subject that I have made, I will destroy from off the face of the earth. It had never rained before. And that Brother George was describing to us here a while back. Above the earth there was a canopy with water, water. And when it comes time for it to rain, he opened up that canopy and there were millions and millions and millions of gallons of water came coming down. Underneath the crest of the earth, there was millions and millions of gallons of water. And it started seeping up. And as the water came down, and the water coming up, water started rising, people, animals started hunting for high places going. They kept looking, 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 climbing until they completely run out of place. And pretty soon, it was all dead. And then, when the animals were loaded, God shut the door. <coughs> and 
in verse 5, it says again, And Noah did all according to that the Lord commanded him. He still obeyed the Lord. In chapter 3, in verse 6, it said that Noah was 600 years old when the flood came up on the earth. says the ark rested upon the Mount Aaron. Verse 6, it says, After forty days, Noah opened the window. God told Noah to open the window of the ark. Verse 8, Noah sent out a raven and a dove to search for dry ground. Verse 9, Noah built an they return without uh, proof of dry land. Verse 10, seven days later, Noah sent out another dove. Verse 11, the dove, the dove returned with a olive leaf plucked, a green olive leaf plucked off. Proof that there was life in their water was low. Verse 12, another seven days later, he sends out another dove, and it did not return. And when that dove did not return, Noah realized that the ground was dry. Verse 15 through 19, God commanded Noah to unload the ark, his family, and all the creatures. In verse 20, I'm going to read this one. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered a burnt offering on the altar. Now, did you hear when I said there was four males of clean? I wonder why it was odd number. It odd there was one set aside for the sacrifice. Verse 21, And the Lord smelt a good, a sweet flavor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not any more for man's sake, for the image of man's heart, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from this youth. Neither will I again smite any more ever living things as I have done. He made a promise that he would not flood the world again. And every time we see a rainbow, that is a reminder of his promise to us. And chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his son, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. God Bless Noah and his family, and now he command his family to go out and start to replenish the earth, to repopulize the world. Now, the conclusion of what we read here and talked about is this. 
because of one man of all the population in the world at that time. Trust it and obey God. We are here today being able to worship the Lord. Now we can look through the Bible and see many other others that trust and obey the Lord. We can look at Abraham. Twice in his lifetime. Once he was told to leave his at 75 years old, he was told to leave his parents' house and country and go into a country that God would lead him to. And he left the next morning without knowing where he was going. 35 years or so later, after God had given him and his wife to, to a child that he promised them, God told him in the middle of the night, Take your son and go into a mountain and I will show him and sacrifice him to me. And this morning, without question, Abraham got up and followed the Lord. And when he got to that mountain, he built the altar. He laid his son down on the altar. He was ready, had the knife ready to put into him. And a voice came from heaven and said, Stop, it was just a kiss. And when he looked around, there was a ram in the thicket. If you look at Moses in his lifetime. Three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they would not follow the king's direction of worshiping the golden image, that he had in place. They were thrown into a fire, a fire, heated up seven times, and he walked out without a burn or a mark on him. Then, disobeyed the king's decree of praying to anybody except to the golden image, and every three times a day he would put face toward Israel and pray. And because he done that, he was thrown in the lion's den. And of course we know what happened in the lion's den. He walked out the next day alive. He read through 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd uh, uh, Chronicles. When, it, when the king of, of Judah and, and Israel of uh, Jerusalem, when they trusted and obeyed the Lord, there was peace in their life mostly. If there was war, they would have won the battles. There was plenty, of, they had plenty to eat, drink. They was happy. But then when the next king come in, and he didn't follow the Lord, they, they had war, they lost it, fenced it. Around the building, uh, their cities was torn down, their cities was destroyed. It was often marched in with captivity for years. And there's others we could look at too, some of the prophets. And in the New Testament, I think of one a man by the name of Saul that persecuted Christians. Went so far as to get a letter to go to the masses to bring uh, Christian back from and back to Jerusalem to be punished. Boys, girls, men and women, they didn't matter what age, they was going to chain them and drag them back to be punished. And on the road to the masses, a light shone around him and he was converted. And God changed his name to Paul. <laughs> And Paul became one of the first century missionaries. He also became one of the most famous and well-known missionaries even through this time. He faced a lot of things in his life. He was beaten and thrown out of cities. He was stoned. He was thrown in prison. He was shipwrecked twice. And then 
and one of them shoot reds of a deadly snake come out of the fire and then bite him and lashed on to him and then it let go and even the Islanders were surprised that he even survived. And he ended up being served the rest of his life, <laughs> living the rest of his life in a Roman palace under house arrest but had the freedom to move around he moved around and he still went out and preached to the Jews. All because they trusted and obeyed the Lord. The question is you. Do you fully trust and obey the Lord? <coughs> There's a song in our song book we sing. This is morning. And of course, goes like this trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Please stand. somebody here today in your life. Lord, I pray, Lord, you'll have your will in your way in this invitation of time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.